I love this. I love it. I was not expecting that at all. Hi, it's Todd of Todd's Workshop and Todd Cutler here. And today I'm back with a brigandine, a real proper section of brigandine and a fistful of arrows and a lockdown longbow behind me. And we're gonna shoot the hell out of this with everything I've got. And we're gonna see the different arrow types and what they do or what they don't do to the brigandine. First of all, of course, what is a brigandine? Well, I'll talk you through it. Well, basically, this has been the back panel of one here. It's an armored jacket, much like a bulletproof jacket is now that you're all sort of fairly familiar with. It's flexible, it's articulated, so it's actually relatively comfortable to wear. They were relatively cheap because the size of the plates was quite small and you could make them and often were made from recycled armor. So from armor from previous centuries. Very, very popular, very popular in Spain and Portugal and Italy, a little less so, but still popular in France and England and outside of those areas, not so much. But they're made from small plates. Now that does two things. One is it allows the whole thing to articulate and to move. So it's actually relatively um, flexible, relatively comfortable armor to wear. Very often worn as standalone armor, just on its own with like a, an arming doublet underneath, just a very thin padded garment, possibly. And you often see it with archers and crossbowmen with maybe a mail shirt or some sort of thicker fabric armor. Um, and again, you'll sometimes see it with spaulders, you'll sometimes see it with proper armored arms, or splints, you know, they're just worn in a variety of ways. They're essentially a fairly, not necessarily low grade, and that's what we're here to find out, but essentially a fairly low cost armor. Ran from about 1450 through to about 1500. Great variety of, of, of looks and appearances. And this one here is sort of a very much a munition grade soldiers kind of a piece. Now, what is also worth mentioning about these when we come to the penetration of it is this here is made of 1.2 millimeter mild steel. Now, they could be made of wrought, they could be made of proper steel, but the plate thickness is a very interesting one. And my friend Ash, who is a fantastic brigandine maker, has discussed this with me at length. We're gonna come back and look at his work in more detail. I'll show you a little bit now as well, but we're gonna come back and do another film with him where we talk all things and everything's brigandine. Now in discussion with my friend Ash, he was saying that he's examined brigandines where you have adjoining plates where one was 0.8 mil and the other was two mil. Basically, they're just recycling the armor with not a lot of care or, or, or thought about what they're doing. They're just putting the things together to make brigandine panels. So that means that you can't just sit here and go, oh, well, it didn't go through here, so it won't go through there. Because actually, it may well have done because the things were so varied. Now, part of the story with brigandines is who made them? And that is a great clue to the quality and the, the skill of the manufacturer behind them. Because it's probably different in different countries, but looking at England, as far as we know, they didn't seem to be controlled by a guild. They didn't seem to be controlled by the Armourers Guild, which perhaps you would expect. And there does seem to be significant evidence that tailors very often were responsible for their manufacture. But presumably, again, not under the Tailor's Guild work. So they seem to fall outside of guild work, which means they fall outside of quality standards. Now, I'm sure they're going to be better quality and lower quality, but your average munition grade brigandine could be anywhere between really quite good and really not at all. But what we're going to do now is take this brigandine, mount it on our boss and shoot the hell out of it with a fistful of arrows. So what I've got here is my standards. So I'll just show you those. Now, what we've got here are the arrows I've been using throughout, but you'll also see that I've greased them really heavily. I'm gonna give them every chance we can to get them through. So we've got a type seven needle bodkin, a type nine plate cutter as it's often called, but short bodkin, it's a type 16. Now I've got soft ones, mild steel ones, and I've also got some harder steel ones at about 0.6% carbon. And right at the bottom, we've got an M2, often known as a Tudor or a Towson bodkin. I'm back at the range with the lockdown longbow and excitingly for me, a new camera after the plumbata fiasco last week when I managed to kill one of mine. We've got all four arrow types and hopefully again, we're not gonna to kill too many of them, but that is a hard target down there with the brigandine. So I am expecting some to get mullered by this. Now, what have we got going on down there? We have got my brigandine sample with a big orange triangle on the back. That's roughly where the leg of lamb is. That is my target zone. Now I've shortened this because I wanna get as many arrows as I can on target. So we're down at about 15 meters, something like that, 15 yards. Now, for those of you who've seen previous lockdown longbow films, you know that even out at 75 meters, we've only lost about 10 or 12% of the speed of the arrow. Yeah, this is a short range, but it's gonna help me a lot with the test. So we have our brigandine. Under that, we've got an arming doublet. 
then we got the leg of lamb, then we got a bag of sand to simulate torso weight, and it's all on a stand, which is just a little bit wibbly wobbly, so it's got a little bit of give in it. First up, Type 7 needle bodkins. Let's see what we can do to it. <laughs> oh my goodness me. Well, <laughs> I don't think there's any argument about that one, is there? Right, uh, needle bodkins, brigandines, not looking so happy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to do the third one. I'm really not. I think because I don't want to fill the whole place up too much. So next up, and this I'm really interested about, Type 16, so the barbed arrowhead. Now why this is really interesting is because these are the only ones that I've really been able to find which have a reference for having steel in. For a hunting head that makes no sense. Maybe they've got a different role. Let's find out. Now one of these, this one, I've marked up with an H because it is hard. The other two are in mild. Let's find out. I love this. I love it. I was not expecting that at all. Well, I think if, if the hard one does it well, let's find out if the soft one does it. Let's do it. It's getting a bit predictable, isn't it? Right, we're going to go on to the uh, M2, the Towton or the Tudor head that is often known as, because that is absolutely contemporary with brigandines. So these two will have faced each other off. Let's find out. Now, I think from memory, this was the fastest of the arrow types in my earlier tests. It's a few months ago now, but it'll be interesting to see what this one does. It's also the lightest. They're all at it, right? Let's go again with an M2. Lovely stuff. Right, now the last of them is the Type 9, the short bodkin. This is often known as the plate cutter. Now the supreme irony here would be if this didn't go in. Let's find out. It went in. So we're going to do one more, and then we're going to go and have a look and see how deep that Type 9 went in. Because it's not enough just to go through, it's got to go through deeply. And that one didn't. Interesting. Let's go see what we got. Now this has got really interesting. Here are our M2s. They penetrated and they stuck in. We saw that. We absolutely saw that. But they've fallen out. So they were in, not that deeply. We have got a needle bodkin. One of them fell out. This one is still there. Well, <laughs> It's actually got blood from the lamb on it, but that is how deep. So in context to my finger, it's about 50 millimetres, something like that. 50 millimetres, two inches. That through the brigandine into the body underneath, probably not a killing shot, but it could have been. This one here is the type nine, and this is the type 16, the bladed one, the armour piercing one. So let's just pop that off. Oh goodness, this, this is messy. This is really messy. Oh, fantastic. But this is where it gets really interesting. The Type 9, which is what we know as of as a plate cutter very often, short bodkin. Presumably, we think, against armour. That one has gone through the furthest against this plate here. And that's gone through about 70, 75 millimetres, so heading for three inches, two and three quarter inches, something like that. But for me, what's been very interesting has been this Type 16. This is the hard one here. Not the soft one, that is the hard one, and it has gone through and into some poor fellow's body cavity. I was not expecting that, but it does perhaps explain the presence of steel on Type 16 heads, so that you, they're very effective, basically, against at least thin, low-grade armour like this, and against flesh. Right, back to base to conclude. Oh, fabulous. Now, the first thing to say is, do you remember, right at the beginning, I said these were a fairly low-grade armour, very often made of scrap. This plate might be 0.8 mil, this one might be two millimetres, one over there looks brilliant, this guy's here looks just as brilliant but actually is rubbish, it's covered in fabric and tin and you can't know because you don't know what's underneath. Not until you're shot at.
So just because the arrows went through this one brigandine doesn't mean that all brigandines are useless against arrows. And equally, it doesn't mean that just because somebody goes, oh, his is a high-end brigandine, that it is going to be proof against arrows. We simply don't know. We simply don't know. But we know that this one behaved like this. 1.2 millimeter mild steel plates covered in tin, five layers of linen inside with the arming doublet of linen and wool with the arming doublet. And that is what happened. Now, if we go through our arrowheads, interestingly, uh, Will Sherman, myself and the other guys actually from um, the original Mythbusters Arrows vs. Armour film were wondering about the presence of steel on Type 16 arrowheads. It doesn't really make sense on a head that is against flesh. It's not required. But here it showed without the steel present, the arrow did not pass through the brigandine. With the steel present, it did pass through the, the brigandine. And it passed through enough to get into somebody's body cavity. And with barbs on it, that is a messy day. The Type 9, the short bodkin, that is the first time that I've really seen it against metal and really work. And it really did. It penetrated more than the others, around about 70, 75 millimeters. So nudging on three inches of depth. That is significant. That is something that you do not want. The needle bodkin, well, that went in maybe about 40 mil, small hole. You know, if you're lucky, it's not gonna do you too much damage. That was one of them. The other one in less, don't forget. But interestingly, one of them definitely, you can see from the hole sizes, definitely crossed two plates. So it was penetrating through two plates and it did do it, but only a little bit. Making a hole is not enough. It's how deeply it goes through. So you can't look at a plate and go, oh, it's made a hole, it's gone through. It means nothing unless it goes through like that. And then the last one, and this surprised me as well actually, was the M2, the, the Taos and the Tudor Bodkin it didn't fare very well. And the two are absolute contemporary. Brigandines and M2s were absolutely the arrowheads and the, uh, and the sort of low grade bulletproof jacket style armor that was present at the same time. And yet one didn't work that well against the other. That interested me. The other thing that really must be noted is I was expecting to walk up there and just find a pile of bits, dust and splinters and arrowheads. That's why I put all that uh, netting around it to try and catch it. Not one arrowhead broke, not one. That's probably partly due to the way the brigandine functions as armor, which protects the arrows, but it also protects the person inside because it progressively gives. You, you do a strike in this place and it puts the load going concussively out from there across the armor, moving all of the plates and distributing them a little bit. So yes, it might make a bigger bruise here, but by the time the energy gets here, it's really largely dissipated. And that is a very good factor that is not true of things to fabric armor like Gamb Gamberson so much. But that's a very good factor that protects probably both the wearer and, ironically, the arrows with the brigandine. But it's also, when we come back full, full circle, I believe, I'm on very sketchy ground here, but I believe there's a modern ballistic armour called Dragon Scale that works exactly in the same way, that it has smaller multiple plates rather than singular big ones. But again, write in and tell me. I'm sure you'll let me know if I'm wrong. But it's just another interesting point for discussion where brigandines fit into the world of armour. But anyway, thank you very much. It's been for me again, another absolutely fascinating test because it just didn't do what I was expecting it to do. I thought it would turn the arrows pretty much and it really didn't. So brigandines, lockdown longbow and four different arrow types. Thank you very much. <laughs>